Hi, I'm Jim Garrity of National Review, and I'm joined by Ed Gillespie, who is running for Senate here in Virginia. Ed, not too long ago, you had a nice, happy life in the private sector, doing pretty well for yourself, not having to deal with any of the stress and aggravation of being a candidate. Um, why did you give all that up? Why, what are you doing with your life? What are you doing uh, running for Senate and you know, subjecting yourself to all this? Well, I think we've got a huge opportunity here in Virginia to affect the future of the country. And uh, it's a country I love very much, uh, love Virginia very much. And if you can make a difference and you're in a position to do so, I think you've got a moral obligation to try. And you know, the good thing is, is that it turns out I love being a candidate, so I don't feel the stress and the frustration. I enjoy being out there, talking to people, listening to people standing up for things that I believe in and holding Mark Warner accountable for his record and I enjoy it. So uh, I'm, I'm very glad we made this decision and every day the campaign gets stronger and stronger and we're enjoying it. Okay. As a Virginian, this has not been the best, as a Virginia Republican, this has not been the best of times. The governor's race did not go the way we hoped. Barack Obama has won it twice, lost the last couple Senate races. Um, so what's got you confident about running in a state that's kind of been, you know, described as a purple state and sometimes seems to be trending blue these last couple cycles? Well, it is a purple state, and I think pendulums swing, and I think the pendulum is swinging back uh, toward the Republican side. I think the fact is that a lot of Virginians are frustrated with the direction of the country. They're frustrated that Senator Warner has not turned out to be the senator that they mm -hmm. hoped he would be or thought he would be or said he would be. And I think that they know that this is an opportunity for us to try to make a change and to try to improve the, you know, the direction of the country to you know, create jobs and raise take-home pay, lower health care costs, and bring down energy prices. And they know that the policies of this administration that Mark Warner has supported 97% of the time mm -hmm. since taking office are not working. And so I do believe that, uh, you know, we, we are still a purple state. The governor's race was very, very close. Uh, our Senate seats, you know, have been changing hands. The governorship mm -hmm. changes hands. It's, uh, it is the nature of Virginia. And I think that uh, we're at a point in the political uh, arc where uh, it's time for, for a little bit of a check and balance uh, to be provided. The fact is, this is the first time, you know, since 1969 that all five statewide offices are held by Democrats, and I think that, uh, that Virginians are going to say, you know, we need a little bit uh, more of a check and balance here, and that'll help me. Okay. I was walking through your, your illustrious campaign headquarters yeah. here. Uh, above a paint store, yeah. down the down the st street from a shooting range. Right. So I'm sure our friends at the NRA <laughs> will be very impressed with that. You, do you get a chance to go out and fire anything? Or, uh, you know? I, I haven't yet. Uh, just uh, been out on the road, but uh, haven't right. haven't uh, hit the range here. But uh, maybe maybe sometime soon. Mostly, you know, we're out there uh, carrying our message on our RV of, mm -hmm. of late, and uh, it's going very well. But yeah, we haven't. You know, wasted a lot of money on exorbitant office space. I, I uh, noticed that. Lean and, yeah. mean, lean and mean operation here, and uh, but it's great. It's a great location, and it's very efficient space, and we like it a lot. So there's a couch over there. that I'm just a little afraid to sit on right at that point. Yeah, I think but, it uh, goes back to 1977. Is my. Okay. I was going to say the John Warner <laughs> campaign. So, um, so just kind of kind of checking around. No shortage of drama in Virginia politics lately. Uh, Eric Cantor kind of you know kind of blindsided by the results of that primary. Um, as a guy who has formerly been part of the RNC. Um, I, I don't think it would be harsh to call you once part of this, the, the definition of the Republican establishment. Um, what was your take on that race? Lessons for Republicans? And what did you take away from that surprise? Well, I, you know, I think a lot of it was unique to the 7th District. And uh, Eric's a friend, and I think he has you know, been a, a great servant leader for uh, Virginia. But the, the voters in our primary uh, felt a need for a change. Uh, respect that. I called mm -hmm. uh, Dave Bratt, congratulated him, looking forward to campaigning with him. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that I've been trying to do here in Virginia, and with, I would say, you know, a good amount of success when you look at the, the convention we had, is to unify uh, our party, regardless of what door people come into the process through, whether it's a Tea Party door, or a Libertarian door, or a traditional unit door. You know, we're all together, and, mm -hmm. and we're all in agreement on 80% of what we're for and 100% of what we're against. And uh, I have found uh, that, you know, the energy on the ground uh, is very strong, uh, very intense, and it's you know going to be favorable toward me in November. Uh, I, I think you know we saw with uh, uh, with Eric in the seventh district in that primary. There's a lot of anti-incumbent sentiment out there. I don't think that's limited to Republicans. I think mm -hmm. it's uh, very strong with a lot of independents and a lot of open-minded Democrats as well. Uh, any lessons for the Republican Party on immigration on that in that result? Well, look, I think that uh, you know it is a very uh, challenging issue for us and uh, one where I've been clear with the voters going into our convention what my views are on it. Uh, I you know, believe we have to secure our border. Mm -hmm. We have not only a, a right but a responsibility as a, as a nation to do that. And the things that we do to you know, secure our border and, and keep people out that we don't want to you know, come into the country, 
will allow us to have a rational system to let good people in that we do want coming into the country. People like my father, I'm the son of an immigrant myself. And uh, my father came here legally through Ellis Island and contributed you know, greatly to, uh, to the United States of America. I always say mm -hmm. Jack Gillespie was born in Donegal, Ireland, but he died a great American, won mm -hmm. a silver star uh, as an infantryman uh, in World War II. And you know, we need to reform our visa system. 40% of the people who are here in the country right now are here by virtue of having overstayed a visa. That, you know, if that were a private sector problem, we'd, ha we'd have it fixed by now. Mm -hmm. And I think when we take steps like that, uh, you know, and, and secure our border, which which we need to, you know, we'll be in a position also then, I think, to come to terms with those who are here now uh, illegally. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's fair to people who have come here and played by the rules legally mm -hmm. to grant citizenship to those who have not. Uh, so, I, you know, I think, you know, you have to have a clear stand and you have to let the voters know where you are on the issues. It always seems like an emotional issue, but it feels like this recent swath of unattended children coming over the southern border um, it's hard to think of anything more emotional or heart grabbing or something. So, um, if you become elected senator, President Obama will still be the president. The odds of him listening to you are not great. But let's suppose he did come to you and say, uh, Senator Gillespie, what should I be doing about this influx of, of unattended children coming across the border? Well, first of all, understand that you know when you uh, act unilaterally and you issue executive orders, there's you know, going to be, uh, you know, unintended consequences to these things mm -hmm. when you don't go through a legislative process uh, that allows for people to have the input and to anticipate such things. So, you know, that, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with the adverse effects, uh, I think, of, of uh, executive action and we should have a legislative uh, approach here. Mm -hmm. And look, I think there, you know, legislation, uh, you know, is the right way to do it, not by executive order. And I also think, though, that uh, you know, before any legislation is is moved on this front, we should wait until I get to the United States Senate and five other Republicans yeah. like me do as well. Well, there, okay, there's a lot of conservatives out there who are, who are obviously very frustrated by the 2012 election results. Um, kind of like, ah, oh, you know, we're dealing with this guy until you know, January 2017. If you're a conservative, uh, let's say Republicans do win a majority in the Senate. Um, obviously, you know, President Obama is not going to roll over and, and do everything Republicans want to see. What, what realistically could get passed or could get to his desk, or what, what are the consequences of a Republican Senate for your average conservative grassroots voter? Well, there's a number of things. First of all, you know, they changed the rules in the Senate. Uh, mm. You know, if after two, over 200 years of, uh, of custom and tradition, they changed the rules to say, we're going to confirm nominees with 51 votes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's critically important now, and so having a 50, you know, one vote Republican majority uh, would have a very significant impact going forward in terms of nominees, and in particular, judicial nominees. Mm -hmm. And it's very likely or possible that, you know, we'll see, uh, could see a Supreme Court uh, nomination over the course of the last two years of the Obama presidency. So. You know, very important in that regard. Uh, right now, you know, what we see is Harry Reid, because the Senate uh, is where good bills from the House go to die, mm -hmm. you know, things don't get to the president's desk and the president isn't forced to sign legislation or veto legislation and stand by a veto. Uh, and with a Republican majority, I think we'd be able, obviously, to move uh, good bills to his desk. Uh, and that is a different situation. Having worked in the White House, it's different when you actually have to sign or veto something as opposed to have somebody run interference uh, for you in the United States Senate like Harry Reid and the Democratic majority do now. Um, any particular bills that you'd love to send to his uh, desk and see what he does? Well, sure. I mean, you know, first of all, a number of things on, on, uh, uh, on Obamacare. Uh, and I know that he's not likely to sign a repeal Obamacare bill. I understand that. But the fact is, I think there are a lot of things that we could do uh, to you know, make sure that Obamacare is not further ratcheted into mm -hmm. place. I believe, you know, we, we need to repeal it and replace it. I think it's fundamentally flawed in its structure, and it's designed to get us over time to a single-payer system. Uh, so clearly, uh, on health care, there are issues that uh, I think that, you know, uh, I would make a, a priority mm -hmm. uh, in terms of my economic growth agenda. The biggest drag on economic growth right now is Obamacare, in my estimation. The second thing, though, is I think if you could get, uh, you know, to his desk, uh, votes on energy. And, for example, the Keystone XL pipeline, which, mm -hmm. again, we saw a couple weeks ago, Harry Reid and the Democrats with a, with a blockade of amendments stopping that from getting to uh, the president's desk. We need to get that to the president's desk. We need to get the, the Keystone XL pipeline approved. I think we can stop a lot of this onslaught of federal regulation, uh, which is coming out of the administration, in particular from the EPA, but a lot of other agencies uh, as well if we had a Republican majority in the United States Senate. So. To me, and, and, you know, maybe he'd even be open to, but I doubt it, you know, uh, taking a look at our corporate tax code, which is, you know, the highest rate in the world and is forcing 
uh, a lot of investment to go overseas rather than uh, investing here in the United States. We just saw, you know, the Covidian uh, deal with Medtronics uh, out of Minnesota, purchasing an, an Irish company, but becoming an Irish company in the mm. process. And that's not the first time that's happened. It's, it's happening more and more, and I think it's going to happen more and more as a result of, uh, of our corporate uh, tax code being punitive to doing business in America. And you know, we're in a, in a competitive global economy, and we're losing that competition as a result okay. of that. Uh, traditionally, in midterm elections, foreign policy, national security aren't really big issues unless you have a 9-11 style event. But as we're talking about the, the, having this conversation in mid-June, a lot of foreign policy in the news lately. Iraq is blowing up, yeah. uh, the, Berg, Bo, the Bo Bergdahl deal and, and the ramifications of, uh, for Afghanistan releasing those five Taliban guys. Uh, Russia and Ukraine was once a, a, you know, dominating the news cycles. Um, one, if you get to the Senate, how much would, would foreign policy, national security issues kind of, uh, you know, uh, grab your attention? Would you want to focus on that stuff? And again, in the unlikely chance, the president came to you and said, what should I do? What would you be advising him on these various fronts right now? Well, one, I would like to serve on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, I, I think that uh, national security is an important issue. My focus uh, right now in this campaign and what I've been talking about is economic growth, the need for us to create jobs and raise take-home pay, lower health care costs, reduce energy prices, as I said a moment ago. Uh, and as I travel the Commonwealth, that's what I hear from people is economic anxiety and concerns, uh, rightly so. People are feeling squeezed, and so uh, those are, you know, my priorities in terms of, uh, of policy, but major concerns about our national security and, and foreign affairs. We all know that this administration's approach to, uh, you know, international relations and, and foreign affairs is, as they've described it themselves, leading from behind. Uh, there's another word for that, and that word is following. And okay. we're seeing the ramifications when the United States recedes from a leadership role in the world. Mm -hmm. We're seeing it in Ukraine. We're seeing it in Iraq. We're seeing it in Syria. We're seeing it in the Middle East. Uh, we're seeing it in China, North Korea, uh, Nigeria. And, and uh, so I do think it's an important issue. And I, I hear it coming up more and more uh, on the campaign trail. And there's a real concern, obviously, you know, we're, uh, uh, you know, the Commonwealth of Virginia has a long, proud history. Uh, of you know serving the defense of our of our country, and uh, you know for example in Norfolk where we have the largest navy base in the world, there's a lot of concern about slashing the navy to pay for more Obamacare, which is exactly what's going on. There's no two ways about it, and you know we need to be uh, building ships and and increasing our our number of ships for our navy to meet our national security needs according to the you know to the Pentagon. We're going the exact opposite direction right now, and so that's a legitimate concern. The concern about how our veterans are being treated by uh, in the VA process. Uh, obviously, deep concern about that, and we're a commonwealth with over 800,000 veterans. Hmm. And uh, yes, there is great concern about uh, uh, the, the five uh, Taliban leaders, named by the Taliban, asked for by the Taliban, being released uh, in exchange for, for Bo Bergdahl, and I hear about that more and more. So national security is increasing uh, in terms of interest as an issue in the commonwealth. Okay. Um, I realize that by the time this, if people get a chance to look at this, the circumstance in Iraq may have changed completely. But as of now, the U.S. is sending 275 troops into Baghdad to secure the embassy and evacuate personnel. Um, Baghdad has not yet fallen to ISIS, but things are looking very ominous on that front. What should the U.S. be doing in Iraq right now? Or, or should they be doing anything? Well, yeah, I do think we should be doing something. Of course, what we're dealing with is what we haven't been doing, uh, mm -hmm. and the fact that the president has, uh, you know, not worked to get a status of forces agreement uh, with the Maliki government and, uh, you know, has been more focused, uh, I think, in, you know, achieving an objective that he stated of, you know, getting our troops out of there without having a, uh, a national security uh, or, or, you know, military objective tied to it, and, and we're seeing that right now. Uh, you know, it's obviously very disconcerting to see the United States hoping that the mullahs in Iran are going to help, uh, you know, uh, uh, provide stability somewhere. Uh, that's not really their nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to me, uh, you know, what we're seeing now is the result of this receding from a leadership role, from a lack of commitment to the region and, and a spreading, uh, you know, chaos mm -hmm. uh, that started with the, you know, when he, when he didn't uh, stand by the red line uh, in Syria, uh, when he set up what I believe was a politically motivated timetable for withdrawal from Iraq. And, uh, you know, I think we need to demonstrate to our allies and to our enemies that this is a country that is going to protect its interests and is going to stand firm, and we're not seeing that right now. Sure. Um, then just kind of shifting back to the campaign for a moment, you're taking on a candidate, a, a, a Senator Mark Warner, who is uh, independently wealthy, made, made his money already, uh, has a significant campaign war chest already, and if he really needed to, 
it's not clear that he would. He could always write himself a large check and all that kind of stuff. How do you compete with that? How do you keep up with that? I mean, you have, you know, you've been in Republican politics for a while, so you have some friends and connections and things like that. But uh, are, you, are you worried about being vastly outspent, considering how that was a pretty key factor in the governor's race last year? Well, you know, I'll, I'll be outspent. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, you know, given his uh, personal fortune, I mean, he's the, the second wealthiest member of the United States Senate, second only to someone named Rockefeller. Oh, there you go. So, <laughs> so he's got a little money too. You know, he's, yeah. he, he'll be able to, uh, to put what he, whatever he wants into this campaign. I understand that, but we'll have the resources that we need to get our message out to the voters of Virginia that they'll see He's not been the independent voice that he told us he was going to be. He's voted with the president 97% of the time. He's not a fiscal moderate that he pretended to be. He's voted for $7 trillion in new debt, nearly a trillion dollars in tax increases, and he voted against a balanced budget amendment on the Senate floor after when he first ran saying he'd be for it. That he has you know, not been a pro-business Democrat, as he's purported himself to be. Uh, his rating from the NFIB, the premier small business group uh, in the last Congress, was 38%. He's for a carbon tax cap and trade legislation. And obviously he cast uh, a deciding vote for Obamacare to move it forward after telling us he'd never vote for a bill that would mean losing our insurance if we wanted to keep it. We'll have enough money to make sure uh, that Virginians are aware of that and also aware of my positive agenda mm -hmm. uh, for economic growth that I think you know could result in, obviously, uh, if we were to double our economic growth rate and policies like I'm talking about I think could do that, we'd have 10 million new jobs in our economy. That would mean 3 million of our fellow Americans would be lifted out of poverty. And that would mean that instead of getting government benefits, they'd be paying taxes, and that would mean our deficit would come down. Doubling our growth rate would bring our deficit down by a third, by $3 trillion. So, you know, we can do these things with the right policies, and I'll have the, the resources necessary to make sure that voters know the clear choice uh, uh, between what Mark Warner has done and will do if he's reelected versus what I'll do if I'm uh, given the opportunity to, to serve my fellow Virginians. Yeah. Ed Gillespie, thanks very much for your time. You thanks, Stick Jim. around for part two, the personal side of potential Senator Ed Gillespie.